Good morning, everyone. It's time to investigate again the Word of God and learn what is so critically needed for all of us in these days that the Scripture calls perilous times. I begin by introducing something here that I think we need to look at very carefully in the world that we live in and why it's going to have a tremendous bearing upon all of us. There's a reason why we've been called at this time and why we're in this day and age to witness the truth of God in our time, just like others whom God has used in past periods of time. It's all recorded for our learning. In Romans 15 and verse 4, you hear me quote this many a time, and I can't get over that because it is written, as God says, what will be is what has been. If you want to know the future and see where things are headed, Go back and see what happened to the people of Israel and then look and see what the prophecies say about the future. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, read that whole chapter and you'll see that the Apostle Paul said all this is written for our admonition. It's for examples to teach us something. Not the world. Study Israel. Study how God worked with those people and recorded and dealt with them it's going to tell us how he's going to deal with us in the end time because that was the former, that was the physical application, how God dealt, and then this is the spiritual that we're going to experience. This is what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 10. And read chapter 9 as a preface to it because he says, therefore, and then he goes into chapter 10. Now that's all important for a very specific reason because nobody really understands what's going on. And it's even difficult for people in our congregations of the Church of God to really assess what's going on because they're not making the comparisons of what God has always, always done and how he operates. The point being is this, God says, behold, I change not. He, what he did there in the physical is what he's doing now in the spiritual to teach us this very important lesson. So we talk about the subject of faith comes into play. Faith is more than just positive thinking. That's what some people think faith is, just positive thinking. But positive thinking is not producing faith. It doesn't produce a trust in God. We have to learn how God operates. We learn, need to know God. Not about God, but know God. Hebrews 11, verse 6, that's the famous faith chapter. We're told that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Absolutely impossible. Because you have to come to God and you must believe that he is, that God exists, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So if you don't believe, if you don't want to check it out, then God is saying, forget it. It's not going to do any good for you. You've got to believe in this relationship, getting to know God. And this is important because in Luke 18 and verse 8, Jesus made this statement, which is really something we have to take into consideration as members of the body of Christ. He says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith on the earth? Well, why, why does he say that? Because you and I are witnessing something right now. We have moved into a period of time, it's, you could call it an implosion, an implosion. Everything is caving in, in the realm of trust and faith. People are having a hard time trusting and believing what they hear because everything has been so confusing or fake news as we've heard. And we've seen a lot of disinformation and things to lead people astray that are absolute lies. And yet nobody repents of that. Nobody says, I'm sorry. Nobody makes an apology. And that's why it's important to keep in mind, knowing Jesus is a very, very special relationship that we are developing. Spending time in communion and fellowship and relationship with him that's what produces the faith and the righteousness that God wants us to have. 
We're living at a time where God is going to bring us all to a decision. You may have thought you made that decision at baptism. Well, you did. And you said you were going to go all the way, that you were going to endure to the end. Now, that has great weight for us who have actually committed ourselves to it. But you know, there's a lot of people they don't, that, that doesn't mean anything for them. They just, they went under water if they were baptized to join a church. And many times it was just the church of their own choice. It wasn't the church of God. They weren't called at this time. But God is bringing us into church. He says judgment is now on the house of God. And he's asking, do we trust God or do we trust man? Who do we want to go to? Do we want to stay with God and come out of slavery? Or do we want to go back like the Israelites of old wanted to go back to Egypt under slavery? There's coming a time, dear brethren, when we're going to face some absolutely mind-staggering things that you and I, I can't explain it to you. I don't want to dwell on it. Because the thing of it is, we don't want to be wrapped up in what's going on and around. We need to be aware of it. Jesus told us, be aware of these things. But don't be wrapped up or fearful about these things. Look up. Keep your eyes focused, like Mr. Tuck was saying in his little comment there, about what? The kingdom of God. Jesus told us to seek first the kingdom of God. Now in Isaiah 1, chapter 1 and verse 18, God puts it through the prophet this way. He says, come now, let us reason together. Let's get our thinking caps on. And yet, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, we're told that we must walk by faith, not by sight. Walk by faith, not by sight. So what happens to our reason if we walk by faith? What happens to it? Well, the knowledge of this world would tell us this. This is the world we live in. Unless I see it, I won't believe it. Or they'll say seeing is believing. Not necessarily. Because they forget that there are three things going on in this world. They don't recognize the top layer, which is the plan of God that is being worked out. They only see the layer they're living in, this dimension right here man's world and the things that go on in man's world and they don't see the other world of the dark side the invisible side in which works with the nations of this world because right now all the nations of the world are under the influence of the god of this world second corinthians 4 4 and who is he he's none other than satan the devil now, people will laugh, they'll scoff, they'll say, <laughs> the devil, I don't believe in the devil. Fine, don't believe in him. That's what he wants, a carte blanche. He can work absolutely free in hand, knowing that he can take advantage of one who doesn't believe what God is saying. No, God's way is different, and you and I have been called to be different. In fact, we really basically fall into a category called iconoclastic. We are iconoclasts. We are different. Different because we choose to walk in the ways that God has outlined for us. We don't want to be like everybody else. But everybody else wants to be like everybody else. That was the problem of ancient Israel, if you remember. God selected them and he called them out and made them a special people. He was going to be their God and they were going to be his people. And what did they say? We want a king like everybody else around. We want to be like everyone else because, you see, peer pressure is pretty hard. And unless you are committed, peer pressure can really work a number on you, whether you're an adult or whether you're a young person. And that's what we're going to face in the years ahead, peer pressure. And we're going to need to know where we stand in this matter. So God's way is different. Yes, it is. And God says that we will only see, only see the things he's talking about if we believe. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. You, if you don't believe, you're never going to see these things because they're spiritual in origin and they must be revealed 
in the scriptures through the Spirit of God, which does what? It leads us. It leads us to the answers and shows us how God operates. We see how he operated in the Old Testament, and yet today we're told, oh, that's all done away. That doesn't operate. Oh, boy, we're in trouble. Because Jesus in the New Testament, you remember, he said, hey, if you want to know about the abomination of desolation, yeah, I want to know about that. Tell me, where do I go? Go to the book of Daniel and read it. Can't do that, Lord. Why? The, the, the pastor just got up and told us the Old Testament done away. The law is done away. Nothing applies anymore. Now all we have to do is just love Jesus and we're okay. Is that right? Is that what the Bible is teaching? Well, Jesus could not do many healings in the town of Nazareth where he grew up. Why? It says because of their unbelief. If you don't want to believe, that's your choice. You can choose to believe or disbelieve. But when you believe, you have to have confidence in knowing who you believe in. And today the implosion is falling down on confidence in anything. People don't have confidence in their governments. They don't have confidence in their leaders. They don't have confidence here, there, where, you name it. Fill in the missing blank. So what we end up doing, and in order to understand how to believe and do what Jesus is saying, in order to trust him, we must get to know him. There was a song years ago, some of you may not have heard it, I think it was done by the Dreamweavers, if I remember. It was called, To Know Him is to Love Him. Now that particular song, while it was talking on a physical level, if you bump it up, and I love some of these songs that talk many times about the man, the woman, their love, and their relationship, but I love to bump it up to a higher level. And when you do that, you come in contact with God. And you come in contact with Christ. Because why? They love us. They have made it manifest how much they love us. John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son. Why? So nobody perishes, but everybody could have what? Eternal life. What a promise. What a tremendous promise. So what I want to do is go through something here that maybe you've never thought of before. I've entitled this message, Knowing God is not just professing God. Knowing God is not just professing God. And you'll see as we go through this why this is so important. In John 17, John 17, down in verse 3, Jesus makes this statement. He says, and this is life eternal. This is where eternal life comes from. It says that they may know, notice again, if you want to know about eternal life, you have to know something. You have to know that you are the only true God. Jesus is saying that his Father is the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So we've got to come to know, to know God by first of all knowing our Heavenly Father, which Jesus came to reveal to us, and we have to know whom that Father sent, and it was the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why is this important for us today to know as opposed to professing? I think you're going to see something here that is quite eye-revealing, and it makes us understand something of why people are, why they are, like they are, what they do. They may be sincere, but I like what one man said one time, if you look carefully, there's a lot of sin in sincere. There are a lot of people who are very evil people are very sincere and have done great evil and harm in human history. When Jesus referred to his second coming, this is his second coming, and his relationship to many professing Christians at that time, he declared something in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. You'll want to get that one down because this is an important scripture. He says, there's coming a time he's going to say to somebody, 
not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord. Well, that out, we can just eliminate all the pagans and all the others in different religions because they're not going to call Jesus Lord. And it says, they're going to come and say, Lord, Lord. He says, not many of these. He says, not everyone. Some maybe, but not everyone. So out there, there are some sincere people that will come to repentance and understand why they, sh they have been in a state of professing Christ rather than knowing Christ. So not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of the Father, my Father, which is in heaven. Now he carried it on a little bit further in Luke 636 and he says now he expands this and he says many will say to me in that day when Christ returns he says Lord Lord have we not prophesied in your name and in your name have cast out demons or what appears to be casting out demons I will add that in there and in thy name many miracles well, there's all kinds of miracles going to happen in the end time. False miracles, lying miracles, things that we need to be mindful of. And what is Jesus' response? What's his response? He goes on to say, And then will I profess unto them. You profess to me that you're on my team, I'll profess to you back. And what am I going to profess? He says, I never knew you. Oh, wow. That's something none of us ever want to hear. We never want to be on that side of the coin. So what's he talking about? He says, he's going to say, I never knew you. And then he says, here's the reason why. He says, because you that work iniquity this is why you're going to have to depart i never knew you iniquity is lawlessness that's where we get in first john chapter 3 and verse 4 where whosoever commits transgresses the law if you transgress the law of god what happens transgress the law of god for sin that's what defines sin now it says is what the transgression of the law. So when we break the law of God, or better say, violate, because you really can't break it, but you can violate it. And if you give violation to the law of God in any way, then it says, whosoever commits sin is committing lawlessness. Lawlessness. Now this is interesting because, again, what we're being told is that these people who are prophesying, casting out demons and doing miracles in the name of Jesus, what are they? They are the very people who profess to be Christians. There are many people today that claim to be Christians. And God is saying, not necessarily so. A lot of people who want to believe they're Christians could be what? doing lawlessness. Now, how would that translate? Because that would mean, in essence, from Jesus' point of view, if he's saying, I never knew you, he's saying, you're not a Christian. You're not a follower of me. You don't know me, and I don't know you. Well, that becomes very up close and personal for all of us. And we want to know Jesus. We want to understand him. We want to be like him. Because that's what the Father's looking for in all of us. And so what do we learn here? We learn that the Western world of Christianity, the Western world of Christianity, where most people will, you'll find Christians, and they'll be scattered around in other countries, but they'll be following Christian, supposedly, teaching. But there's a problem with that. The Bible says Satan deceives the whole world, Revelation 12, 9. And in so doing, what has he done? He has individuals believing in the Western Christian world because we embrace the Bible 
He has attacked the Bible in such a way and he's turned it in such a way to make people think that they're Christians and they're A-OK with God and have a get out of jail free card to go to heaven because they believe in Jesus. Because this is what they profess. If you ask them some questions, if you ask them some questions, do you keep the law of God, the Ten Commandments? Well, no, that's in the Old Testament. That's done away. That doesn't apply because we have the law of love now with Jesus. But according to the New Testament, it says this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and they're not, they're not a heavy burden. So what's going on here? What we're finding out is what is spoken of in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5. Go there with me if you would please. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 3 introduces the time frame that we're really living in now and seeing the not only a physical manifestation, but we're having it being driven by a spirit phenomena because the spirits that work behind the scene work through the governments of the world. And this is why Ephesians chapter 6 tells us we wage war against wicked spirits in high places. You see, like God has a kingdom and he has control and he has different regulations and guidelines for all that serve him, so does Satan. Satan has some pretty powerful demonic angels that joined ranks with him when he rebelled and he gave them power over the nations and so those principalities can be translated governments. Well, Daniel 11, tell, Daniel 10 actually, tells us there was a time that there was the Babylonian, then there was the Greeks, and then there was Rome. These spirits rule over the world in which we live. And most people can't see that because they don't believe in it. You know, if you say, I don't believe in the sun, is the sun going to go away? No. Why? It can't. It's locked in. God put it there and it's doing exactly what God said it's going to do. So what do we have here? We have here now in verse 5, notice verse 5, it talks about all these things going on, the condition, the way people are thinking, the way they're behaving, and then he says the following. He says in verse 5, they have a form of godliness. Notice there is a form of godliness going on in the Western Christian world. People go to church on Sunday. People obey what they believe to be from the Bible. Many of us may have done that years ago until we recognized there was a need for change in our life. And we knew that if we made that change, something was going to happen. Other people wouldn't understand that change. And that's why Jesus said, you thought I came to bring peace. He says, no, I came to bring a sword. A sword? What do you mean? He says, a man's foes shall be those of his own household. People in their own house, their own family, won't believe what you believe. They'll look at you and think, what happened to you? I mean, you used to be like all the rest of us. That's the problem. You used to be like the rest of us, and we were. Now we're different. Who made us different? God made us different. When he called us, and he says, many are called but few are chosen. You're still here, and you've been chosen to run the course till the end. There are many people who have been called, but they hung up the phone after a certain period of time and said, I'm not interested anymore, Lord. You and I are going to face things that we can't explain, things we we can't deal with, and we're going to have to be exactly like the Bible said, we got to run to God, our refuge in Psalm 91. There's your place of safety. It's not a place called Petra. Petra may be for the Jude- Judean area, where it says the people in Judea in that time are going to flee to the mountains, but that's only a thought. That's not a guarantee. They're going to have to go to mountains to escape. But what about the rest of Israel, the house of Israel? Because that's the house of Judah he's talking about. The answer is, he's working with us right where we are, in various countries, in the house 
of Israel. All right, they're going to have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof from such. What are you and I told to do? Turn away. We can't get involved. Well, that doesn't mean we don't say hi to people and be friendly. We have to be a light, not a loudspeaker. But when they ask us questions and they are sincerely interested, you give them a little bit to see how they're going to respond. And if they respond properly, give them a little bit more. But, you know, it's like feeding an animal. Animal takes a bite, chews the bite. You don't take all the grain and just shove it down its throat. You choke the animal to death. The same way with us. You try to give too much information to people who don't have a background to it. There was a time you and I didn't have a background. We had to do something, as the Bible says, to study, to show ourselves approved to God. And we didn't know what we didn't know. And then when we knew it, oh, bingo, the lights went on. Because God's Spirit illuminates the mind. And if you're being called, you will understand this very thing. But notice why, why the problem. They go around having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And you and I are supposed to stay away from that. Now, why is this so important? Because God has given us not the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's what God has given us. Because we now look to God who's in charge, and it's his plan, Alpha to Omega, all the beginning to the end, and we rest in God. We don't, we're not all upset. We're going we're gonna to have to deal with some things, obviously. The Bible tells us that. But you know, to give you an idea about this, what it means to get to know God, as opposed to just professing, let me show you something I discovered years ago and why I'm here on the Sabbath. Why I'm here on the Sabbath. Now this was in my Bible, in an information section, items of information concerning the Bible. I got this years ago when I was a young person. I was a teenager at the time. This is from my parents. And I treasure this Bible because of that. They gave it to me. They set me off on the course that changed my life. What I thought I wanted to be at one time, oh brother, would I have been in trouble if I had followed that. How do I know? Because I have a book that explains everything about that, that particular thing I wanted to be at that time. And oh boy, every one of those situations when I read the account, they get their little shot of glory, pow, and the bottom falls out. God says, I've come through Jesus, John 10. He says, I've come that you might have life. I want you to understand about why you're alive. You're not an accident. You're the unique individual, no one like you, and God made you that way because he loves the uniqueness of his people. But we are all subject to herd mentality. We can be driven like sheep into a wrong direction if we're not careful. And if we don't listen to the shepherd who guards our very lives, our souls, so to speak, what happens? You go off in different directions and you lose your point of reference. God is our point of reference, like the North Star. People couldn't go on the nations on the high seas if they didn't have that star. Now, who fixed that star? All these other stars are moving all over the place. Why is that one locked in? Because God knew people were going to need a, bar uh, a barometer to ride the high seas on a curved earth. All these things are, God thought of everything. He's an incredible God. And today we see the benefit of that with all the modern technologies that's coming on. But this technology can be used in a wrong way. Well, this is what I found in my early embryonic beginnings of the things of God. And I found it quite interesting because I didn't know this. I was just like everybody else. I thought, you know, everybody can't be wrong. Oh, yeah, they can be wrong. They used to say not everybody could be, well, look at the Russians and Chinese and everything. They all think they're right. We think we're right. But the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man or to nations and what they do. But here's what I found and discovered. Well, listen to this. The subject is the day of rest among Jews and Christians. The day of rest. Okay, I said that catches me. I happened to hear some radio broadcasts back at that time of talking about God and the Sabbath. The Sabbath. Uh, 
need to look into this. So I did what? I looked there. It says, in the biblical week, notice, the biblical week, the day was reckoned from even to even. Okay, and then it gives a bunch of scriptures in Genesis. The seventh day, Genesis and Exodus, was kept from sunset to sunset. And today, most Jews and some Christians, I would add the initial thing, some biblical Christians, some biblical Christians, they observe the seventh day, and then in parentheses it says Saturday. Bingo! Saturday. How important is this day to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy? He went on to say they kept Saturday as the Sabbath. The majority of people, oh yes, the great majority, they can't be wrong. God says they're wrong. How do I know? Listen to this. The majority of people professing Christianity. Professing Christianity. Now oh, this is interesting. This group keep the first day, Sunday, as a memorial of Christ's resurrection. Yeah, they do. Although there is no express biblical command to observe the first day of the week. Bingo! That's so, that did it for me. I can't go to church on Sunday. Why? It's not the day God wants me to go on. And then it goes on to say, we learn. Now, who are we supposed to learn from? Either God or man. Let's listen to what man has to say. We have, Al, uh, we have Justin Martyr. You might have heard that name. Clement of Alexandria and Tertullian. Who were they? They were Catholic writers. Catholic writers. And what did they do? They said that Sunday observance was practiced by some Christians. Notice, the early church was keeping the Sabbath. Now something called Christians were moving to Sunday. And Sunday observance was practiced by some Christians in the second century, not the first, but the second. And in 321 AD, Constantine the first, emperor of Rome, published the first civil law, not a biblical law, recognizing Sunday as the day of rest. Now today, all the so-called evangelical churches, well-meaning, and there's a lot of them out there, a lot of well-meaning people, They've got a mix in their religious belief. That mix is they get some of the answers right and they miss a lot because of what? Simply because they're listening and learning from man, not from God. They think they're learning from God. But these writers were from a group called the Roman Catholic Church. And what was the Roman Catholic Church? They were the ones who, in their own official records, it won't take time to go through all that stuff, but they were the ones that officially changed what? The worship of Sabbath to Sunday. And they, broad, they broadcast, he says, there's one article I remember reading, this one Catholic priest made the following statement. He says, you know, he says, all these Protestants, he says, they call us, they call us this, they call us that, they call us that, uh, you know, we're the, we're the mark of the beast and all this other stuff in Revelation. But, he says, when it comes to Sunday, they all bow the knee to Rome. Who changed it? Have we forgotten? There were a lot of people who died as martyrs because they kept God's way. They died in the Colosseum simply because they wouldn't observe the things that man was introducing. They changed laws back at that time. They're changing laws today. Genesis 4.1. God uses this word no for a very interesting reason. It says, and Adam knew. He knew his wife, that was Mother Eve, and she conceived and bare Cain and Abel. 
So again, God uses the word no to mean a most intimate relationship. Now, a man and a woman who are married have a most intimate relationship when they produce a child. God is producing his children, and he wants us to have an intimate relationship with him in the same way. What does a spiritual intimacy involve? What, what, what should we have? Well, just like a husband and a wife, they're close friends. They can talk to each other. They can share everything if they really are deeply in love with one another. There, it's, it comes second nature. Now, in talking to God, that's the same way. We have to ask ourselves some very important questions. Do we know God, or are we just professing to know God? See, that's a problem. People know about God, but to know God is different. You and I are in the process of learning how to know God. What's he like? He tells us in the Bible. He says, what has been is what will be. You want to know about me? Study what I have done in the Old Testament with the people of Israel, because that's what I'm doing with you in the end time. But it's going to have a spiritual consequence. But you can understand it if you look back and understand the past. Because I changed not, God says in the book of Malachi. Now here's an interesting part that is something that we should understand. God is still writing a book for us. He's writing a book. You know, God has told us the beginning. He's told us the end, but he hasn't told us in the middle. That's where it gets a little uneasy because we don't know what's going on. The pages are empty for you, for me. But just like people had their names written in the book of Acts, if you studied the book of Acts, you'll notice at the end there's no amen. I believe that there's going to be some additional writings to certain books where there is no amen at the end. You can look and check it out yourself, which books are talking about that. And here's the interesting part. Will our names be written on those empty pages? I hope, if so, it's all good and not bad. Okay, so here we are now. We want to get close to God. What do we do? We have to feel comfortable in His presence. All right, when we pray to God, do we feel comfortable in His presence or is it form and ceremony? You might stumble a little bit in the beginning stages because this is something you don't do. Even the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so he told them exactly there in the beginning, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he gave them instructions what to do and how to get to know and get close to God. Uh, we must be able to tell him that we love him. When was the last time you just used the words, Father, I love you? Lord Jesus, I love you. Thank you for loving me. It's important. I mean, how can a happy marriage exist if a husband looks at the wife and he never says, I love you? Or the wife never says to the husband, I love you for who you are. Because, you see, nothing is, nothing is gained by hatred. That's why Jesus said, you have to do what? You have to understand it is love that displaces hate. When you're loving someone, there's no room for hate in your life. But if you're filled with hate, it eats you up like a cancer. That's what Jesus was telling the people. And they wanted to see him come down on the enemy of the Rome. And he just says, no, you're going to have to learn to love your enemies. And that was foreign to them. They said, man, how do you, how do you love an enemy? Well, the answer is, Work through God. God will teach you how to love enemies. Most important thing is don't let enemies get close to you. Keep them at a distance because enemies will do you harm. Those who are in love will do the right thing. Then we must not be afraid of him. Where people have grown up, God's going to get you for that. Now these are some of the traits of how to know God, how we respond. Now in Hebrews 10.31, if one is practicing sin and lawlessness and violating, even like it says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves as some do, he said, if you're going to continue on and walk contrary to God, then you've got every reason to be afraid. Because why? It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
Remember what the songs we sang today? How beautiful some of those words were if you really listened to them as you sang? Especially how it says, fear fell upon all those when they heard what was done by this God of Israel. Their gods couldn't do that. But boy, who are these Israelite people are? They did it, and it was fantastic. All right, then what do you have? You have these precious promises. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Every one of us have been given precious promises. And we're told that we're in, when we face troubles, we're to call upon God. Psalm 50 and verse 15. He says, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will, I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. That's the problem. People don't want to glorify God. He provides our food for us. Yes, he does. Matthew 6, 32, it says the Father knows we have need of these things, but it's what the Gentiles seek, the nations. They're more interested in the, the physical things that they want. God's more interested in our character and developing the Son of God in our lives. And the more we try to be like that, the better off we will. Yes, and he'll always be with us even in time of calamity. Time of calamity. We have to call upon him and not man. Now, that's a command in James 5, 14. Is any sick among you? Call for the elders. Who do you rush to first? Do you rush to God in prayer? Or do you rush to man, the medical profession? Then you know they got, they, they got all the answers. Why? Because they're wearing a white coat and have a stethoscope around their neck. And because of that, that's impressive. They must know. But you run them through all the battery of tests and what ends up happening? Bingo. Well, you seem to be all right. Well, we don't seem to talk. The problem is, folks, they, have, they don't know how to get to the cause of some of these things. They're well-meaning. I mean, there's a need for medical. I understand that. I'm not saying avoid unless it could hurt you. If it could hurt you, stay away from it. Whatever it is that could hurt you, stay away from it. And these are things that God wants us to recognize. So, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15 tells us we must study to show ourselves approved to God. If we don't open the book, we don't know what's in the book. Even Jesus used the term. He said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. You think it, but you don't know until you can read it, see what he's saying, and then do what? He said, believe. Believe. Why is that important? Because unbelief cancels out everything. That's why Satan doesn't want you. Satan doesn't believe it. He didn't want us to believe it. You and I have to fight the good fight of faith against the enemy. But God is our shield and our buckler. I hate to say it right now, dear brethren, if you understand the parallels of the old to the new, the house of Israel went into captivity in three successive waves of invasion. If you go back and study that, you'll see some very interesting comparisons. The first invasion with the Assyrians cost them their wealth. They bought off the Assyrians to try to keep them at bay. It's happening to us today in the end time. We've already gone into the first wave of our slavery that God prophesied is coming. We're right now in economic slavery. Oh, you're getting your checks from the government, IRS? Worthless pieces of paper, but as long as there's confidence in it, we're okay. We can spend it. One day they're going to change it all. How do I know? Because they're telling us that. Listen to what they're saying. The Great Reset. We, this is the greatest opportunity we've ever had. Never. We can change the whole world and make it heaven on earth, utopia. And that's where the devil has been trying to go. He tried it with Adolf Hitler, remember? A thousand years of the Millennial Reich. They didn't even last f four years. Well, what about this end time? It's coming again. The next phase that you'll have to watch is where they're going to manipulate the Constitution. And once our safeguards of the Constitution are gone, we're going to be in grave trouble. 
but you will have no rights. They will determine who your right, what your rights will be. And you will have to either know what God says or you'll go to man for answers. All right, so reading the Bible, learning how to discern the Bible. Young people need to read the Bible. To find, they say Abraham Lincoln. He didn't go to church. All he had basically was reading the Bible. He grew up reading the Bible. But he understood what he was fighting back there in the Civil War years. And he realized it was more than just what was on the surface. There was some insidious force behind the scenes causing that great, terrible catastrophe called the Civil War. And things are going to happen again because of that unseen power that is going to take over now, as God says, for the closing days and the years ahead. So reading the Bible is important and praying daily is important. And I will just close it out with this. You never get close to God until you get on your knees. You never get close to God until you get on your knees. But, Pastor, what happens if your knees are weak and you can't get down? There are exceptions. God hears you wherever you pray. But if you can, you can put a pillow there to soften it, get on your knees. It will give you the perspective you need to understand that you are submitting yourself to a higher power. And what happens if you don't? You choose not to do it? Well, you've made your choice and only time will tell. Start with a, you know, don't try to, don't try to climb the mountain overnight. You may be awkward in your beginning stages. Pray 15, 20 minutes. Do it maybe two, three times. Try to pray in the morning when you're most alert. Just like in school, you go to school, you're most alert by the time you get to the end of the day, your brains are about fried and you don't follow those classes too clearly. So here again. When it all gets said and done, I'll end with this scripture. Jeremiah 29 and verse 13. Jeremiah 29 verse 13. You will seek me and you will find me, but only when you search for me with all your Heart. We can't allow our hearts to be divided into this world, one foot with God, the other foot with the world. We've renounced the world. We've told, been told to come out of this world. Yeah, we live in it, and we'll have to go through whatever is going to happen in the years ahead. But one thing we know and have great confidence in, whatever happens, our great God is with us. And Jesus told us in Matthew 28, Closing verses, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age.